All right, brethren. Brother Adam brought out a good question. I want to address it before I go forward because I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. Whenever the Lord in eternity, when He chose His people, He chose His people. But that was, and He predestinated His people. But that was not, and, and those He passed by, that was not Him positively, in a positive way, predestinating them to hell. It was simply Him choosing His people and predestinating His people. You'll never find in Scripture that God predestinated a man to hell. He chose His people and He predestinated His people unto salvation. He passed by the rest. And the reason I say that is because now, now their condemnation, the non-elect's condemnation, was all in the purpose of God from eternity. But whenever, whenever God reprobates a man, that's a positive act. That's a positive act. Him passing by them in eternity, that's not reprobation. Reprobation is a positive act earned by the sinner. When you go through Scripture, we saw it in, I believe it's Isaiah 65, we see 2 Thessalonians. Everywhere God says He turns a man over, He says it, there's a because attached to it. And the because, the reason, is always the man's sin. And the reason that is, is because God is just. Men that go to hell earn it. They earn it. And God's just to send them there because they sinned against God. Men who are saved, it's all of God's grace, all of His choosing, all of His saving. And He gets all the glory. You understand that? I hope it's not confusing. Uh, my point is, you don't attribute unrighteousness to God. And to, and to say that God just arbitrarily predestinated him into hell is attributing unrighteousness to God. God does nothing that's unrighteous. When he sends men to hell, it's a just thing. They earned it. You see what I'm saying? He's just. He's righteous. All right, let's go to Exodus 10 now. Exodus 10. I just want to read my text. Exodus 10, verse 7. God had warned Pharaoh that he's about to send locusts and he's finished, going to finish destroying all the crops in Egypt. And it says here in Exodus 10, 7, And Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? And Moses and Aaron went, were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God. But who are they that shall go? And Moses said, We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds will we go. For we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be so with you as I will let you go. And as far as your little ones, look, for evils before you, not so. Go now ye that are men and serve the Lord, for that you did desire. Pharaoh said, the men could go, but the little ones couldn't go. He thought evil. He thought they had an evil design in what they were planning. And he said, so I'm going to keep the little ones, and you men can go. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. And so then the Lord brought the locusts, and Pharaoh pretended repentance, and God removed the locusts, and then God sent darkness. And now drop down at verse 24. And Pharaoh called unto Moses, and he said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. And Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not a hoof be left behind. For thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. All right, brethren, back to Exodus chapter 10. There's two things I want to show us from this text. Total redemption and total consecration. Total redemption and total consecration. All God's elect have been totally redeemed by Christ. Every single one of us. Once for all time. 
and all shall be brought to be totally consecrated to Him. All have been totally redeemed that God chose, and all whom He chose and redeemed shall be totally brought to be consecrated to Him. Now first of all, Christ has redeemed the total number of all God's elect. Christ has redeemed the total number of all God's elect. It's, see, it's what we see represented here by the fact that no one and no thing in Israel would be left behind. No one and no thing, no cattle, nothing, would be left behind in Israel. And that's a type of the redemption being complete and full and total of all Christ's people. Moses said in verse 9, We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds will we go. And down in verse 26, he said, There shall not a hoof be left behind. Brethren, the children of Israel here are a picture of God's elect, the Israel of God. And just as the children of Israel were in bondage, all God's elect come into this world in bondage. We come into this world in bondage because Adam willingly sinned against God in the garden. We come into this world in bondage to the law. We cannot, we cannot give the law what, what we owe. We're in bondage to the law. We come to this world in bondage to our fallen sin nature. You and I, we just read in Romans 6, we're servants of sin by nature, and we can't free ourselves from that slavery. Number three, we come into this world in bondage to the devil. Ephesians 2 says we all were under the power of the devil by nature. And number four, we're in bondage to this sin-cursed world. And one day, Christ will even redeem our bodies and our whole selves from this world, out of this world. Moses here is a picture of Christ our Redeemer. Israel is a picture of His elect. Moses is a picture of our Redeemer here. In Acts 7.35 it says, This Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. That angel was Christ that appeared to him in the bush. And he sent him to be a deliverer. That's what a redeemer is. And so just as Moses was sent by Christ, Christ was sent by God the Father to be a deliverer, to be our redeemer. And just as Moses was only sent to deliver the children of Israel, he wasn't sent to, there was a lot more people in the world and a lot more nations around, but he was not sent to do anything for those other people. He was sent only to the children of Israel. And so Christ was sent into this world only to redeem His elect. Only for those God chose before the world was made. Now, God has many elect. The Scripture says it's a multitude no man can number. He promised Abraham they would be more than the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. That's a lot of elect. That's a lot of elect. But make no mistake, brethren, Christ did not come to lay down His life for everybody. He did not. He did not. Just as Moses declared that He would redeem all that God sent Him to redeem, Christ redeemed all those the Father gave Him in divine election. Christ said, I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. And to show us that not everybody is His sheep, He said to some standing there, you are not of my sheep. Nothing could be more clear. You're not of my sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. You're not of my sheep. Again, He said, makes it clear that not everybody is His sheep. He said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. It's important to declare, brethren, that Christ only died for the elect. It's very important for this reason, so that we give Christ all the glory that's due unto Him for accomplishing their redemption. I would never make the statement to people, God loves you. I don't know. I don't know. God loves His elect in Christ. I know that but I don't know who they are. So I can't just make this blanket, state, blanket statement, God loves you. I don't know. I don't know. 
But everybody he loves in Christ, everybody he chose in Christ, he saves them. Christ redeemed them. Let's say I was willing to pay off somebody's mortgage debt in here. Let's, let's, we're really pretending. <laughs> Uh, how could I do that unless I first chose for whom I will do it? See what I'm saying? I, you just can't pay a debt by just paying. You have to choose somebody to do it for. There has to be a, a price that's owed for you to accomplish redemption. It's impossible to pay a price owed and redeem from bondage without doing it for a particular person. And the very meaning of the word redeem declares that. You know what redemption means? Redemption means buying again. Redemption means purchasing something by paying the price demanded. Purchasing something, a, a specific thing, by paying the specific price that's demanded for that thing. That's redemption. Scripture calls Christ's people His purchased possession. He purchased us. The Scripture says, to his believing people, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. See, redemption is purchasing his particular people by paying the particular price that was owed for that people. And that makes us his. That makes us his purchased possession. On the cross, Christ was redeeming a particular people, paying their particular debt, the, one, the debt that each of His people owed. That's what Christ was doing on the cross. Well, what was that price? What was the price we owed? Well, we broke God's law. We sinned against God. We broke God's law. And we owed the law of God justice. Well, what is justice? If you've broken God's law, what is justice? What is, what is it we owe the law? Death. Death. That's what we owe the law. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now the price that God's justice demanded, the price that God's justice demanded in order for Christ to pay the debt His people owed, the price that God's justice demanded was Christ's own life. It was His blood. Go with me to Leviticus 17. Leviticus 17, and look at verse 11. The life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. You know what's amazing? God declared this in His Word. Moses recorded it all thousands of years ago. Did you know that it was over 3,000 years later in 1628 that an English physician named Dr. William Harvey discovered scientifically that life is in the blood? <laughs> God declared it right here. Life's in the blood. Read on. Life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Now listen carefully to what God's saying there. God says it's blood that maketh atonement for the soul. Redemption is what he's talking about. It's blood that accomplishes redemption for the soul. By Christ shedding His blood for the life of another, He made atonement. He accomplished redemption for the soul of those for whom His blood was shed. Now that, this verse right here, totally annihilates universal redemption. That lie of universal redemption. It destroys the lie that says the sinner makes Christ's blood to make atonement by personally believing on Him. That's what universal redemption says. Christ died for everybody. Well, if that's so, then the blood made atonement for the soul of everybody. 
If that's so, He redeemed everybody. And then they say, but you make it effectual. You make the blood of Christ effectual by you believing on Christ personally as your Lord and Savior. That's not what that verse says. It says, it's Christ's blood that maketh atonement for the soul of those He lays down His life for. There's a lot in a little phrase. I, that phrase just hit me yesterday when I was looking at that. The life is in the blood. And it's Christ's blood that made atonement for the soul of everybody He laid down His life for. That's why it behooved Christ in all points to be made like unto His brethren. He was made flesh like His brethren. Why? So that He would have blood in which is life. So that He would be able to pour out His life by pouring out His blood and make atonement for His brethren. So it behooved Him to be made flesh that He might have blood and be able to pour out His life. He was made under the law like His brethren. Why? So that He could be made a debtor to fulfill the whole law for us. That was necessary so that by shedding His blood to make atonement for the, He could make atonement for the souls of His people and bring us out. Christ, our sinless substitute, was made sin for His brethren. Why? To manifest God's strict righteousness in that He would not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for all His elect. And why, did he, why would He not spare Him? Why did He deliver Him up for all His elect? Because His blood, by shedding His blood, He would make atonement for the soul of all those for whom He died. He would redeem us. And then after he was made sin, Scripture says he was made a curse. Adam sinned in the garden, and then God came to him, and God made him a curse because of his sin. Christ was made sin for his people, then God made him a curse. Why? So that he might redeem us from the curse of the law by shedding his blood and making atonement for the soul of those for whom he died. So when he said, it's finished, brethren, when our Lord said it's finished, when He hung there in agony and He was coming to the close of those hours of darkness and our Lord cried out and said, It is finished. He was declaring His blood had accomplished eternal redemption for the souls of every single elect child for whom He died. He accomplished redemption. He made atonement. He made redemption. We don't make it effectual. We don't make His blood to have accomplished something. He made redemption. He accomplished it. Neither by the blood of bulls and of goats and calves, but by His own blood He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, He delivered us from the wrath to come. He delivered us from it. Look at Romans 6. This is, this for now is one of my favorite, if not my favorite text. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, brethren, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Henceforth we should not be the slaves of sin. Why? Because he that is dead is freed or justified from sin. He's been redeemed from under that curse. He's been brought out from under it. The man that's dead. And it wasn't just any kind of death. It wasn't just, a, it wasn't just that that first death. It wasn't just physical death. It was more than that, brethren. It was, a, it was that second death. It was that worm that never dies. It was God forsaking His own Son. It was everything that I would have suffered if God had thrown me into hell. That's the death He suffered. It was a living death that He suffered on the cross. When you, when, if the Lord sends a man to hell, when He sends a man to hell, it's not it's not he dies and he's annihilated and that's it. It's a living death that goes on forever and ever and ever. 
Christ on the cross was suffering a living death when God separated Himself from Him in justice. That's the death He died for His people. And since God's just, brethren, His justice demands that all who Christ redeemed just must do what He said there in verse 9, Exodus 10, 9. At the end there, Moses said, We must hold a feast unto the Lord. We must do it. And I'm telling you, brethren, everybody Christ redeemed, they must be given life and faith in Christ because we must be brought to, to celebrate this gospel feast right here. We must be brought to praise our God and praise our Redeemer and give Him all the glory due unto His name. We must be brought to feast upon the Lord because God's justice demanded. He satisfied justice for His people and as justice demands, we be brought to the feast. And so, the mediator of the New Testament, a mediator is one that he, he, he works for God represents God to His people, and He represents His people to God. And He brings them both together. And that's what He was doing on the cross. But Ephesians 2 says, and then He came and preached peace to us. That's part of His mediatorial work too. Both to accomplish redemption by His blood, and then to come and through the Spirit, sprinkle His blood and purge our conscience. For this cause, He's the mediator of the New Testament. Number one, that by means of the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, secondly, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. He redeemed us on the cross and He gets the glory. The glory is His for being the mediator who sends the gospel to us from God Almighty and makes it effectual in our hearts and brings us to this gospel feast. He's the mediator. The glory is His. Just like He sent Moses into Egypt to declare His Word, Christ sends His preacher into this world to declare His Word. And just like Moses was used to bring those people out, He uses His preacher and Christ brings His people out by making the blood effectual and purging, purging their conscience and bringing them to believe on Christ. You remember when Christ took the wine and he, he held up that wine and he said, this wine is a picture of the New Testament in my blood. The New Covenant in my blood. Well, you know back there when that first covenant, that Old Covenant, when, when he sent Moses to establish that Old Covenant, the law came by Moses. And he sent Moses to establish that old covenant. And Scripture says Moses spoke every precept according to the law. He came to the people. This is, how he, this is how he made that covenant. He established that covenant and made that covenant with the children of Israel. He came and he spoke everything, every precept that was in the law. That's what he did. And then he took the blood of bulls and of goats and he sprinkled the blood on everything. Everything that God had sanctified and set apart for His use, He sprinkled the blood on it all. The tabernacle, the people, the priests, the book, everything. He sprinkled blood everywhere on everything. And, and then when He did it, He was saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined to you. This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined to you. Now, Scripture says the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. When our Lord Jesus Christ sends His gospel to each of His children, our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who establishes the everlasting covenant in our heart, just like Moses established the covenant of works for the children of Israel. Christ is the one who establishes this covenant in our heart through the preaching of the gospel. He, he preaches into our hearts every precept of the gospel of His grace. And He writes on our heart the law of righteousness, teaching us He's our righteousness. The law of faith, teaching us that it's through faith that we fulfill the whole law. The law of love, teaching us how Christ bore our burden in love and He teaches us to bear one another's burden in love. The law of mercy, all these different laws of, of the new covenant, He writes on our heart as He, as he preaches 
all the doctrine of the gospel of Christ, just like Moses rehearsed all the precepts that were in the law, he preaches to us all the good news of the gospel and he makes it known in our heart, Christ does. And as he does that, he gives us this wine and he says, this is a picture to, rem to remind you, a picture of my blood which fully established this new covenant for you. This is the blood of the new covenant which is established for you. And he makes that known in the heart and so his child for the first time realizes everything is finished. Everything is done. And he comes and he bows to Christ. He's not bowing to some man that talked him into believing a certain doctrine. He's not bowing into men who, who preach a little bit of truth, but the rest is lies. He brings us to Christ Himself to bow to Christ Himself and our hearts are overflowing with the fact that Christ is our salvation. And this He does through the Gospel. This is His glory, brethren, to do it. And the Scripture says, And how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? When He's done this, you're done with those dead works by which you think that this is going to earn God's favor. That's what makes it a dead work, the motive of the heart. The motive of our heart and everything we did before Christ called us was trying to please God, trying to put on a show for my brethren, trying to get God to save me. Those are all dead works because the motive's wrong. But when He gives you a new heart, now the motive is the love of Christ because of what He has done for us. And that's the motive He'll accept. He brings you to faith, gives you faith, and He brings you to rest in Him, and He brings all His brethren to sing the song that we just sang. Free from the law, O happy condition. Jesus has bled and there is remission. Cursed by the law and bruised by the fall, Christ has redeemed us once for all time. Now we're free. There's no condemnation because Jesus our Lord provides a perfect salvation. This is why Moses said all shall go out. We'll go out with our old and our young, our sons and our daughters and all our cattle and we won't leave a hoof behind because we must hold a feast unto the Lord. We must do it. Christ said it this way, All the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will of him that sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but raise it up again at the last day. This is the Father's will. All that believes on me, I'll raise him up. Oh, sinner, believe on Christ. Trust Christ. Cast your care on Christ now. He's the only salvation of His people. He said, My sheep hear My voice, and I know them, and I give them eternal life, and no man shall pluck them out of My hand. We're all going out, He said. Not a hoof's going to be left behind. They shall not a one of them perish. Now, secondly, I want you to see this. We see in Moses' refusal to come compromise with Pharaoh that Christ brings His people to be totally consecrated to Him. When He gives you this good news and He works this work in our heart and shows us our redemption is accomplished, He makes us totally consecrated to the Lord. Four times Pharaoh offered a compromise. Four times. The first time He told Moses, Go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. Don't leave here. Just do it right here. And Moses said, we'll, we're going to offer the abomination of the Egyptians and they're going to kill us if we do that. Christ will not allow His people to compromise His doctrine with this world. He won't allow it. That's what's pictured there. He won't allow us to compromise our doctrine with this world nor our worship with this world. This world hates the true God of the Bible. This world hates His Christ. And this world would crucify us if they could crucify us just like they did our Redeemer. And so our Lord says, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean and I'll receive you. Then Pharaoh compromised saying, I'll let you go into the wilderness, only don't go very far away. Christ won't permit His child to compromise by being the friend of God and the friend of the world. He won't let you just come 
a little ways out so that you can be back in the world in a heartbeat. He says, come out completely. And He brings His people out of this world. This world must be as dead to us as we are to this world. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. The third time Pharaoh compromised is our text. He said, leave your little ones behind and you're, you that are men go. Moses said, no, we're going to all go. Satan got Adam to turn his back on God. How? Using Adam's wife. Pharaoh said, leave your children here. That'll make you come back. How did, how did sin enter in the beginning? God, uh, the devil used Eve, Adam's wife, to get Adam to turn his back on God. Our dearest loved ones are very often used by the devil to tempt us to depart from Christ and His gospel and His people. Our loved ones. In fact, I don't know hardly any believer who hasn't been faced with this trial of a dear loved one who hated the gospel they preach. I don't know, I can't think offhand of a believer that hadn't suffered it. But Christ keeps His people faithful to Him. He makes His people stand with Him. I knew a man one time, and he, the man professed to believe the doctrine of particular redemption. He faced, professed to believe Christ died only for his elect. But he would compromise with people who preached universal redemption. And he did it for one reason. His daddy and his mother believed it. What did Christ say? He said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It's painful. It's so painful when a loved one when a loved one rejects you because of the gospel. That's one of the most painful things that you can ever suffer. But you know, brethren, a cross is meant to be painful. And our Lord said, right after he said, He that loves mother or father more than me, or son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Then he said, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Stand with Christ. Stand with Christ. Even when your dearest loved one opposes you. Stand with Christ. Christ will bless it. He'll honor it. Honor Him and He will honor it. I guarantee you. I've seen it. And all those brethren I said to you that has faced this trial, I've seen Christ honor them honoring Him by keeping them and providing for them in better ways than they ever could imagine. And be kind to your loved one that opposes you because it just might be that the Lord uses you to bring them to Christ. But stand with Christ. You know, a lot of times we think, well, I can, I can bear witness to them if I, if I kind of compromise with them and I go where they want to go and I hear what they want me to hear and and all that, and then I can bear witness to them of Christ. No, by compromising with them, you're saying it's all right to compromise. The Lord doesn't ever tell us to do that. He says, stand with Christ. Stand with Christ. You want to bear witness to them? Stand with Christ. And Pharaoh's last compromise is down in verse 24. Pharaoh called unto Moses and he said, Go ye serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be stayed behind. You can let your little ones go also with you, but let your flocks and your herds stay behind. Those flocks and those herds, first of all, are a picture of Christ. And in everything our Lord, our, our Lord is doing here, He's showing us we can never part with Christ. You can't approach God any other way than with Christ. They could not approach God and, and have this feast any other way than to have those, that blood shed by those substitute lambs and goats. They had to have that. And the only way God will receive us, brethren, is through the shed blood of Christ. We have to have Christ to approach Him. And another thing that these flocks and these herds represent, 
These flocks and these herds were their possessions. This is what they owned. And when our Lord calls us, brethren, Christ is going to, He's going to require His child to sacrificially devote all our possessions to His service. Not just a little, not just something that's... You know the reason that this place exists right here. I, I looked at all the information on this place when we bought it. You know why this place is here? Somebody gave this land to the church. You know why? It's in a flood zone right by the creek. It's not worth a hill of beans. That's why. Now they've come in and fixed it. The city's fixed it so it doesn't flood. But back when they did it, it was a place that flooded. So that person that gave this to the church didn't do a thing. He didn't sacrifice anything. It was something he couldn't use and gave it to God. That's why we don't have rummage sales to raise money for the church and garage sales to raise money for the church. God's not going to have you giving Him just what you can't use and what's your money you made off of stuff that you've done wore out and tired of using. God requires us to give the first fruits. The first fruits. The first of everything. Listen to Moses. Verse 25 Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not a hoof be left behind, for thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. This is not law, brethren, for Moses. This is grace. The law hadn't even been given yet. The law hadn't been given yet. That's why he said we don't know what we're going to have to sacrifice yet. We don't know. The law hadn't been given. But already in Moses' heart, he was made willing to sacrifice whatever God told him to sacrifice because he was motivated by the constraining love of Christ in his heart. He was a regenerated child of God, saved through faith in Christ, just like every other child of God is. This is, the, this is grace. It's not law. And so people today, brethren, we need to remember this. Since Christ accomplished the redemption of each and every one of God's elect, remember this, not a single one of His elect shall be left behind. Sometimes we get down and, you know, you see your loved one that you love, your son, your daughter, your mother, your father, and you, they don't like, they don't, they hate the gospel, they won't hear the gospel. I had to wait 40 years, 40 years with my dad hating the gospel. 40 years. And God not only gave him faith, he gave me the privilege to baptize him. That ranked right up there with baptizing my daughter. But this is our assurance, brethren. If they're God's elect, Christ has redeemed them. And they shall be brought to the feast. <laughs> they shall be brought to the feast. Just keep declaring the truth to them. Keep standing with Christ and keep declaring the truth to them. If He saves them, this is how He's going to do it. That's how He's going to do it. Every one of those that were in Israel came out. He didn't leave anybody behind. They all came out. And all His people are coming out. If you haven't believed on Christ, do so now without delay. Cast all your care on Christ. I'm telling you, brethren, you that don't, don't believe on Him, uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards described it as a, like, a, like a spider hanging by thread over the flames of hell. All God has to do is just cut the little web and you're, you're gone. The only way we can be saved, the only way we can, can be brought to not only just not want to suffer hell, but to delight in God is for God to form Christ in our hearts. And if He's done that for you, confess Him. Confess Him publicly. He said, Everybody, every man that confesses me, I'll confess him to my Father. The man that won't have confessed me, I won't confess him to my Father either. The man that's ashamed of me, Confess Him. And brethren, as we pass through this life, remember, we can't compromise. We cannot compromise. Not in doctrine. 
Not with this world, not with our dearest loved ones, and not with our possessions. Cannot compromise. Everything we possess is given to us by God. Our doctrine is, our, our, uh, our, this world, our dearest loved ones, and all our possessions. It's all given to us of God. And whatever God, however God says we're to use it, that's how we're to use it. We're just stewards. That's all. A steward takes the goods of his master and he, and he uses those goods just like his master tells him to use them. So all these things, brethren, are to be used like God tells us to use them. No compromise with any of them. No compromise. So therefore, constrained by Christ's love, let us stand with Christ without wavering and let us use our money and our possessions to promote this gospel. You do such a good job of this. I love to look to see where every, everybody that's listening, you know, on Sermon Audio, I like to see that in all the different countries. And I can't believe it. some of those countries, I don't even know where they are. I had to look them up. And there's somebody there listening to this old country bumpkin preach Christ. I bet they're listening thinking, I wonder where that dialect is from. It's from South Arkansas, baby. <clears throat> but I'm thankful that I'm thankful that you do that to send this gospel out. That's our that's our charge. That's what we're here for. To use everything. There's so much that we could do. I, I need I got so many things I'd like to do, and I I could I need help with it. And there's if you want to help with something, let me know. I got plenty you can help with. But this is what we're here for, brethren. And I pray God will bless it. And now let's come and let's, let's honor Him. This is what He tells us. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. And so shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. That's the word of the Lord. All right.